called Israel the News. I do it for several different reasons. Um, but one of the biggest reasons is because I believe it's important for us to understand the times that we live in, what's happening in the times that we're living in, and the technical difficulties continue on. So we just speak against those, amen? Okay, for those of you that don't know or have been out of town or just don't watch the news, there was a major war that just took place in Israel. I would like to spend the afternoon trying to break down to you why, what it's about, what is the reason, what is the purpose. In order to start off, in order to get you to the next part of where we're going to go, we need to start with the Israel news as actually a part of the message today. Rockets were fired from Gaza. Not this weekend, but the previous weekend. There was about 160 rockets, roughly, that were fired into Israel from the Gaza Strip. What you need to understand about the Gaza Strip and what you need to understand about Israel is, is that Israel gave the Gaza Strip to the Gaza citizens in 2004, 2005 for peace negotiations. In 1967, the Arab surrounding countries attacked Israel. In a war of defense, Israel took the Gaza Strip and took Judea and Samaria, what is called the West Bank. Now, in this West Bank area, you have things such as the Dome of the Rock, the Temple Mount, the things that we constantly hear both sides fighting over. You've got the holy sites of Judaism and Christianity, which is really the same thing. Just some are still a little bit behind than the others. <laughs> but the Temple Mount is, is, is so significant to today's events. The war over, over, over Israel is a war of anger, hate, and misinformation. Our country, our media, is full of misinformation regarding who's doing what and who's starting what in Israel. The reason why I can tell you this is because I have direct contacts in Tel Aviv, Israel. I get updated on Facebook as events are taking place. So I'm not telling you this because I've stifled and I've, I've gone through, you know, I've shuffled through the media and I've pick and choose what I like and what I like to hear. I'm actually talking to you firsthand, direct information, you know, straight to the vein. So, there was a ceasefire that took place during this war. The Gaza Strip was, was given over in 2005 in, in hopes of peace. Since then, rockets have just been increasingly fired in numbers over into Israel. Okay? Now, in a retaliation, or in defense is what I should say, of, of Israel, Israel last Monday started bombing the Gaza Strip because they were getting bombed. Again and again and again. They went to the United Nations first and said, look, you guys need to do something about this. If you don't do something about this, we have to defend our citizens. We've got to defend ourselves. So nobody listened. Nobody wanted to do anything about it. So Israel did what they had to do. It's no different than if Canada decided to lob rockets over at us, we'd defend ourselves. If Mexico decided to take those cars that are being blown up on the Mexican border and actually bring them into our own towns and blow them up, we would do something about it a little bit more seriously. Israel has that same international right. So the war took place, and there was a ceasefire that, that, that came to be, I believe it was Thursday. Um, now the ceasefire, in my opinion, and I want to make it clear, this is my opinion, the ceasefire was an opportunity for Hamas, the people in Gaza, to reload, basically. They're out of rockets, they need more ammo. Of course they agreed to the ceasefire, because they hit almost 2,000 rockets that came over. Okay? But, Gaza goes, okay, we're going to do the ceasefire. Israel goes, okay, we're going to do the ceasefire. So, 
What the Gaza people continually choose to do is find ways to get Israel to retaliate and do something to them. If you weren't here on the last Shabbat, uh, we talked about and, and showed you the picture of the 12-year-old Palestinian girl whose mother was behind her with a video camera provoking the little girl to get the Palestinian or to get the uh, Israeli defense soldier to hit her and attack her. She was grabbing his gun, calling him names, screaming at him, because as soon as they get that picture of that Israeli soldier yelling at a 12-year-old little girl, it doesn't matter what the little girl does. As soon as the media gets a hold of it, forget it. It's whatever they say it is. Likewise, during the war just this past week, during this, this situation, the Palestinians were actually taking pictures from Syria, the events that are taking place in Syria, the civil unrest in Syria, they're taking pictures from Syria and saying that those pictures are from Israel lobbing rockets over at Gaza. The BBC has been caught twice now, live, on live TV, caught using pictures that were not of the war. So this is what Gaza decides to do. Um, yesterday, they decided that they were going to send their citizens to the border of Israel from Gaza. Now what you need to understand, why is this so significant? There is a 300 meter buffer zone on both sides. Let's say this is the fence between Gaza. There's a 300 foot or a 300 millimeter meter buffer zone here, a 300 meter buffer zone here. If any citizen gets up to that fence, Israel has the right to shoot them. If Israelis go up, up to that fence and get into that buffer zone, they have the right to shoot. The Gaza has the right to shoot the Israeli soldiers. There is an agreement on a buffer zone. Well, the Gaza people knew this. So what did they do yesterday? They sent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of citizens into the buffer zone. Why? Because if Israel shoots, they break the ceasefire. And the international world goes, see, there goes Israel again. So they're finding ways to get around and manipulate, you know, like a used car salesman. They just, whatever they can do to get you in the car, whatever the Gaza people can do to get Israel to look like the bad guy. So they did this yesterday, and all over the news was basically Israel broke the ceasefire. It's all Israel. That's what we get here. But I want to give you just a little bit of an article here. It says, according to a survey conducted by the Arabic language website, Palpress. The Palestinians are itching for another fight with Israel. Less than a day after the Jewish state agreed to prematurely halt its campaign to eliminate the Gaza missile threat, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said of the unfavorable truce, which baffled many Israelis, that it was right to return to calm to the region as soon as possible. Netanyahu said Israel is interested in a long-term cessation of hostilities an end to conflict. So Israel's saying, look, we, we want this to be over with. But, but just as most Israelis feared, it appears groups like Hamas will only use the days and months of calm ahead to prepare for the next round of violence. And they will apparently have majority support among the public for doing so. The Pal Press survey in Gaza, which was actually an internet referendum, showed that 64% of Palestinian Gaza Arabs oppose a long-term ceasefire with Israel in the Gaza Strip. And why would they vote otherwise? The circumstances of the ceasefire, it was called while Hamas was still attacking Israel. And the sub subsequent Hamas celebrates in Gaza gave the impression that the terrorists had won the brief war in Israel. For all intents and purposes, in Palestinian eyes, Israel surrendered. After the ceasefire was called, all the way up until the evening of that night, Israel still received rockets for hours after the ceasefire was announced. Hours. But Israel still didn't retaliate. Likewise, is anybody here familiar with the Occupy Wall Street movement? You know, the Occupy people, you know, Occupy Anonymous. Okay, well, basically, Anonymous is, is, is an organization of people that are, how do we go into this without spending hours on hand? Basically, they just don't like Israel. They're, they're anti-colonialists. They really don't like America. They don't like capitalism. They really don't care anything for our system, our government, or anything. 
more or less, in, in a short summary. There's more to it than that, so you know, do your own research. Um, it says, during the newly concluded Gaza War, computer hackers affiliated with the global umbrella group Anonymous launched a campaign called Operation Israel to take down Israeli government websites and do any damage possible to the computer system that controls Israel's infrastructure and financial institutions. They failed. As Hamas fired 1,500 missiles at Israel, anonymous hackers launched no fewer than 44 million attempts. I'm going to read that again. Anonymous hackers launched no fewer than 44 million attempts to hack into Israeli computer systems. Israel finance minister Stetsnitsi said they were unsuccessful in all but one instance. One Israel website was wobbly for a few minutes. He told the press conference at the Government Computing Center in Jerusalem. Failing to take out official computer systems, Anonymous appears to now be attacking average Israelis. And this is what applies to us. And this is something that's very serious and applies to us, those that are actually here. It says, an Israeli hacker going by the handle the Joker 80 informed the Hebrew technological website GreekSpot that Anonymous hackers had obtained the email addresses and passwords of 113,000 Israelis and supporters of Israel. The Joker 80 informed readers that nearly all the addresses were from the online email services Yahoo, Gmail, Walla, and Hotmail, and recommended that all Israeli users of those services immediately change their passwords. These guys are hacking into pro-Israel supporters' emails now. If they can't go after Israel, they'll go after Israel supporters. If they can't go after Israel supporters, they'll go after the Bible. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just a vicious cycle. It just, it just continues over and over and over again. Um, what I did, so you guys get a better understanding of what's actually taking place in Gaza, I want you to understand Israel's history before we actually get into what we're going to discuss. Why the hatred for Israel? Why? What's, what's the deal? So I want to give you the actual history of Israel, the history of Gaza, and what's going to take place. So Alex, um, oh, I, I missed hope for Israel. My fault. Did I miss hope for Israel? Did we skip ahead? Did I skip ahead? Okay. Um, well, why don't we watch, let's watch the video. We'll come back to hope for Israel. on the peace process. Many suggest that Israel's presence in the West Bank, what some people call the occupation, is the cause of Palestinian hostility towards Israel. And the reason, there is no peace. But is that really true? If Israel's presence is the cause of the conflict, then it follows that there was no conflict before 1967, when Israel was not in the West Bank, right? Let's look at the facts. The PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization was created in 1964, when the entire West Bank and Gaza was in Arab hands. Why create the PLO in 1964, when Israel has no presence in the West Bank and Gaza? What Palestine were they liberating? The PLO emblem gives us the answer. The PLO was created to remove by force the entire state of Israel from the map of the Middle East a goal clearly stated in their charter. This goal was not new. The PLO was continuing a long Arab history of saying no. No to the national self-determination of the Jewish people. No to recognizing the Jewish ancestral homeland. <coughs> Let's take a look at the history. In 1937, the Peel Commission recommended the division of the land, a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Arab portion would include 96% of the territory that the League of Nations had originally designated for the Jewish homeland. This included far more than just the West Bank. However, instead of accepting the Jews as peace partners, the Palestinian leader, Haj Amin al-Hussein, said no, and found a partner whose vision was closer to his own. In 1947, the United Nations recommended the partition plan which again offered the Arabs far more than just the West Bank. 
The Jews said yes. The Arab leaders again said no and launched a war of extermination. Israel won that war, established the state, but did not know a day of peace despite the fact that its Arab neighbors held the entire West Bank. The Arabs continued saying no. They attacked Israel relentlessly, using the West Bank as a launching pad until Israel took it over in a war of self-defense in 1967. After the war, the Arab League rejected all attempts at peace. They continued to choose force over negotiation. And at a summit in the city of Khartoum, we again heard, no, no, no. Let's fast forward to 1993. Israel and the Palestinians signed the Oslo Accords. Were the Palestinians finally saying yes? It appeared so. Israel said yes and gave territorial control to a Palestinian government it helped establish. But despite signing agreements, the Palestinian actions said no. During the next five years, Israel saw a significant increase in terrorist attacks, which killed hundreds of Israelis. In 1996, Yasser Arafat, the Palestinian leader, declares, we plan to eliminate the state of Israel and establish a purely Palestinian state. But Israel did not give up saying yes. In 2000, Israel's Prime Minister Barak offers the Palestinians 93% of the West Bank. Again, the answer is no, together with increased terror. In 2005, Israel withdraws from the Gaza Strip, uprooting 8,500 Israeli citizens, hoping to advance peace. The Palestinians again say no. This time, they increase rocket attacks from Gaza against Israeli civilians by over 500%. In 2008, another Israeli attempt at yes. Prime Minister Olmert accepts nearly all Palestinian demands, including handing over almost 100% of the West Bank with minor land swaps. The Palestinians, again, no. So what can we conclude? One, the conflict was not caused by Israeli presence in the West Bank. The real cause of the conflict, until today, is the long-held Arab history of saying no. No to peace, no to the existence of Israel, because no is consistent with Palestinian policy, education, and media. Political and religious leaders continuously promote Israel's destruction. Two, Israel has said yes for decades, and has proven that by signing peace with Jordan and Egypt. So, where do we go from here? How do we achieve peace? With some goodwill, mutual recognition of the right to self-determination, and real compromises on both sides. Israel, for its part, will continue saying yes to a real and enduring peace. But for the peace process to succeed, the Palestinians will have to give up their uncompromising choice of force or negotiation and of choosing no or yes. It's about time. It's probably not even true, you know, from different teachers and things of that nature, you know. But this is, honestly, this is the truth. I've, I've done all the research. I've checked all the facts. This is the reality of the world that we're living in. We are coming up against a, a, a type of spirit of antichrist that is coming over the world. You cannot bargain with somebody who does not care about materials. Okay? You can't offer somebody money who has no interest in money. You can't barter somebody, you know, the point, the point of this whole thing is, is, is they don't want peace the way that most people in the world want peace. The, the Palestinians, if you will, and the Arabs have their own idea of what peace is. They believe that this peace will come when the Mahdi comes. Everybody kind of familiar with the Mahdi? 
a little bit. You guys understand what you know what this cup? No, you don't? Okay, cool. Good. That's no, that's fine. That's cool. That's good. That's, I'm glad that you don't because I I I want to give you some information so you can look this stuff up for yourself. Um Number one, um, before we go into the Mahdi, I want to give everybody an opportunity. Alex, can you go back to the Hope for Israel slide real fast? The Hope for Israel, um, I just want to tell you guys about this. It's just something that God laid on our heart. When I was uh, down in Phoenix this week, I met a gentleman named Morin from Hope for Israel. Um, they are based out of Tel Aviv. They also have an office in California. Um, they are a main line to get directly to Israel if you want to help the people that are being affected by the war. They don't discriminate between believers in Jesus, non-believing Jews, Muslims, Arabs, Palestinians. There's no discrimination. These are just genuine. These are loving believers of Jesus Christ who are directly in Israel. They are Jewish believers in Messiah who are there to help all of the people who are in need inside of Israel. They help both Palestinian children, Arab children, Jewish children, Christian children, abroad. So if you have a desire to want to get involved and actually be a main line that you can support and get some financial support into the, the Jewish people and to the people affected by this war, you can go to hope, HopeForIsrael.com. Lorraine is a wonderful man. I've met him personally. Um, they're just doing wonderful work over there. Wonderful, wonderful work. So if you want more information, I give it to you afterwards. Um, you know that we don't ask you guys for money here. Um, we don't have a tithe collecting. We don't do a, a tithing opportunity where everybody comes up and gives. We, we don't do that here. Um, we just, um, we believe scripture says to not give out of compulsion. And that if God places it on your heart to give to somebody, to do that. But we don't ask you to do that. We don't call you up here and make you do something. Um, because you don't want to look like a fool in front of everybody else because you're just sitting there and not giving. We don't feel like that is the right thing to do. That is our personal conviction, so don't feel as though I'm condemning anybody else who does do that, just so you know. Uh, back to the Mahadi, Alex. Uh, the coming of the Mahadi. Islam is waiting for the Mahadi, but what is the Mahadi? Who is the Mahadi? Why is there such a hatred and an anger towards the Israeli Jewish people? Why is there such an anger and a hatred towards Christians? Why is there such an anger and a hatred towards the Bible from Arab people? Why is that even there? Why? What's that? They don't believe in Christ. Well, they don't believe in Christ. You're absolutely right. The Mahad is the uh, Antichrist. That's their Antichrist. Very... Very close. Yes, you're you're touching. You are touching on on, on where we're going to go, but that's that's we're going to get into a little bit better detail. If you have your Bible, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 17. Without knocking stuff over. Genesis chapter 17. Verse 17. I want to tell you about two brothers. I want to tell you about Isaac and Ishmael. Both sons of Abraham. Both had a blessing. Okay, from God. Abraham had Isaac, the son of promise. And Ishmael. The son of the slave woman. In Genesis 17, 17, it says, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him, an everlasting covenant, and his descendants after him. And then he talks about Ishmael. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. 
He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. 